I'm Paul Murray, the founding director of the Centre for Catholic Studies here at Durham University. I'm really delighted to welcome you to the launch of this significant work by Gregory Ryan, The Hermeneutics of Doctrine in a Learning Church, The Dynamics of Receptive Integrity. Thank you for sharing in what I know will be a fascinating and, and enjoyable time together. I'm, I'm going to start with four brief words about the, the plan for our event. First, we hope for it to have something of the lighthearted, celebratory nature of an in-person book launch. So if you spot any friends present and want to whisper a few words to them, then please do so using the chat function. Second, this is something intentionally more relaxed and more inclusive than an academic seminar. Something in which we want all to feel able to be active participants. So when it comes therefore to the plenary Q&A a little later, all should feel most warmly welcome to ask a question. Third, to facilitate some of the ad hoc encounter and conversation that would otherwise happen at an in-person book launch. <clears throat> at two points, we intend moving you into breakout rooms. Equally, however, if that sort of thing suddenly sends a chill of dread down your spine, then just feel free to turn your camera off and take some time out for a few minutes. And then fourth, in terms of format, well, prior to the first breakout session, I'll ask Greg a few questions about his book in a way of opening up something of its riches. And then between the first and second breakout sessions, I'll invite our two other speakers to offer their respective thoughts, Dr. Antonia Pizzi and Professor Bradford Hinze, who we are absolutely delighted to welcome amongst us. One from a very early Queensland, Australia morning, and the other from East Coast, uh, an East Coast US mid-afternoon. And following that second breakout session, there'll be some time for plenary Q&A. Then we'll close the formal part of the proceedings promptly as advertised at 8.45 p.m. But should any wish to stay in the room and to continue the conversation more informally with Greg and I, and I think Tony possibly as well, then we'll keep the room open for a further 15 to 30 minutes. But without more ado, let me introduce the man at the moment, Gregory Ryan. After a successful career as an IT enterprise architect at a major international bank, Greg turned to the formal study of theology relatively late in life it's never too late. Having completed an MA with York St. John, in 2015, he began studying for his Durham PhD, from which this book is derived. And during which period of study, he was awarded both a Catherine Macaulay Scholarship and a Willie Hartley Russell Scholarship. Then immediately following his PhD, he was appointed to a three-year postdoctoral fellowship within the CCS as assistant professor of research for a project on the reception of receptive ecumenism. Alongside this academic work, Greg is director of adult formation for the Catholic Diocese of Hallam, and is also program administrator of the training partnership for Catholic permanent deacons in the North of England. His research and writing interests include contemporary Catholic ecclesiology, theological method, Pope Francis, and Receptive Ecumenism, on which topics he has a number of other publications in print or in preparation. It's really very good to have this opportunity to celebrate and explore your work with you, Greg. So I ask you, are you sitting comfortably? If so, then I'll begin. Let's start by looking at the cover of the book which, you know, you've chosen a really imaginative image for the cover of the book, Greg. Um, perhaps you could tell us a bit about that and how it relates to what the book is all about. 
Thanks, Paul. Thanks for that uh, that glorious introduction. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen so we can see the the image a little bit um, in a little bit more detail. Uh, so hopefully you can see that now. Uh, so my my brother-in-law is a an artist and a, an art historian and an expert in stained glass. So as soon as I started thinking about a book cover, I knew that I'd I'd go and talk to him uh, about a suitable image from his his library of photographs. And I had a fairly strong idea that I wanted an image of um, Jesus teaching the doctors of the law, so the Christ child teaching the theologian, if you like. Uh, so I saw this one quite early on. Uh, this was one that stuck out to me and I, I stuck with it. Actually, I looked at plenty of others, but came back to this one. Because this image resonates for me with the significance of the idea of a learning church, a church where all the parts are learning, all the parts have the capacity for teaching. That all of the systems and formulas we come up with as, as uh, church people and as theologians stay under the constant critique of the living gospel. So here Christ, even as a child, in a sense is demanding a new reception of the scriptures uh, and the traditioned interpretation that the, the religious authorities and the scholars have got. So that was part of it, that the subject matter was, was on this idea of a learning church being taught by Christ and the theologians having to listen, the church leaders having to listen. Um, but there's more to it. In the distance, uh, the portals are opening out onto the landscape. This isn't completely enclosed within the temple. Uh, and I wanted, I like this for the, the image that doctrine isn't just contained in those scrolls. It's not simply in the scriptures. It's not simply in the, in the interpretations and the, the experts, but opens out onto the world and is informed by the world. Uh, and in fact, is, is held in the world. It's held in a particular moment in history, language and culture. But then there's another layer, or possibly even two more layers. In the foreground, framing that glass image, and perhaps so obvious that it's almost invisible, are the stone mullions of the church. Uh, my my brother-in-law, Martin, offered to try and find me uh, an image of the scene from the artist's catalogue, which wouldn't have the, the imposition of the, the church architecture. But actually, this was just what I wanted, um, because this reminds us that the study of inter interpreting tradition, interpreting the Bible, um, doesn't just include looking at the horizon of what's being portrayed. It's not just looking at the past. It's where we are situated. We are literally standing, in this case, in the church, and we're reading that scene from in the church. And there's no way of dispensing with that, that frame, that stonework that surrounds it. That's really lovely, Greg, really lovely. You, you've, you've taken us into, uh, so that's such an eloquent reading of a multi-layered image, which has taken us very effectively into some of the layers of this book. Um, tell me, uh, tell me as succinctly as you can, uh, what was the driving, what was the driving influence to, to write? I mean, why did you write it? Why did you choose to write on this topic at this time? Uh, we've got about five minutes before we need to go into breakout, so let's get through a few. Um, so I guess there's two there's two drivers for this. Uh, one is very pragmatic. Um, I was, came out of my PhD and I, I wrote the PhD thesis with the book in mind. So from the beginning, I tried to write the whole thesis with a narrative flow that would work well as a book. So in, in a sense, it was always there. Um, but why, why write on this? Um, partly because it's a perennial topic for the church, this, this issue of the development of doctrine, of how do we be truth to the past and truthful to the present uh, needs, is one that just doesn't go away. So it's partly perennial. But I think Pope Francis in particular has put this into a new sharp um, focus um, by, by, by some of the things he's said and by some of the things he's, he's done, uh, which show that there are there are different ways of dealing with that question than we might have been accustomed to in the past. Excellent. So um, give us a route map through it, a roadmap for the readers. Talk, talk us through the, the contents, as it were, briefly, Greg. OK, so um, it starts as a, as a way, it actually begins with a text by, by Pope Francis with, with Evangelii Gaudium, um, and particularly with uh, a phrase that he has in there that uh, or a couple of phrases are brought together that um, 
this pastoral style that he's promoting is more about insistently in, uh, imposing disjointed doctrines. So there was two points of tension there that I wanted to pick up and they really defined the structure of the book. If we're not going to have disjointed doctrines, what does the opposite look like? What does doctrines which have integrity, which work together, which have coherence? And if doctrine isn't going to be insistently imposed, then what does reception look like as, as the counter, the, you know, the anti-pattern to that? So I'm moving from Francis's critique of disjointed doctrines insistently imposed to a, an opposite model of integrity and reception. Uh, so that's the, the, the general thrust of the book. How, how that comes about is, um, starts with a helicopter view of this field using an Anglican theologian, Tony Thistleton, uh, to scope out the kind of things that are involved in using hermeneutics to look at doctrine. Adds a Catholic perspective onto that through um, Pope John XXIII's opening address at Vatican II. And then the, the next sections deal with the two components uh, really one at a time. There's a chapter on integrity, which uses Francis Fiorenza's work, and a chapter on reception, which draws particularly on Orm Rush. And then the final major section looks at a case study, which is receptive ecumenism, to try and bring those two themes together uh, in a real place. Thanks very much, Greg. Um, there's so much there that I'd like to tease out further. I'm sure we will do so during the course of the evening in the breakout sessions with our um, contributions from Brad Hinze and Tony Pitze and in the Q&A. Uh, one particular thing I'm hoping we'll come back through is I'm fascinated that on looked at in one way, this is you know, this is a real hardcore academic volume and it looked at in one perspective, serious engagement derives from a doctoral thesis, albeit eloquently written. But as you have indicated there in the way you set it up, um, it, it's also profoundly pastorally oriented, uh, pleasingly rooted. I'm hoping we can draw out some more of that in the course of our conversation. Um, what, perhaps just to ask you, what's, what surprised you? Did anything surprise you? What, what came out of it that you weren't necessarily expecting? I think the, um, the thing that really, really surprised me, the exciting moment in it was when I was looking at um, the, the 2014 and 2015 synods on the family, which were happening more or less at the time I, I was starting research. Um, and when I was studying that, there was one thing leapt out. I was kind of looking at, at how the synod was progressing. And what struck me was the, the difference between the, uh, the questions that were sent out in advance of the 2014 synod, which, um, which were the ones that were circulated and came for a lot of criticism about the ecclesial language that was used and how could uh, a non-specialist understand these, and which began, seemed to begin with the sense that the church had all the answers and it just needed to work out how to present it better. So there's questions on how well known is the natural law in your diocese and how can it be better known? Yeah. And the second set of questions which came out in the lineamenta for 2015 after the first half of this synod, which are very, very clearly based around a see, judge, act model. They start with observe the real concrete situations, bring in the resources from the tradition to evaluate them and then decide what you're going to do on a case by case basis on, on a on the specific case is not a general uh, rule so there's this fascinating switch in methodology that comes around uh, from the um, from that first synod which you know, people criticize that well nothing changed there is a profound change in how the church is is doing its its synodal process which you can see and that hadn't been commented on and that was something that really jumped out in the research so that's probably the exciting moment Oh, well, that's great, which is also a really neat way of um, kind of beginning to answer the, the point I was opening up or illustrating yeah, yeah. I was opening up further about the interwovenness, and extricable interwovenness of the pastoral, the ecclesial, and the really seriously academic here. And that's fascinating. I'd now like to introduce our first respondent. Professor Bradford E. Hinze is the Karl Rahner Professor of Theology at Fordham University, New York City. A consistent concern throughout Brad's illustrious career has been to explore theological and philosophical issues in the interpretation, criticism, and evolution of traditions in theology and church. 
So as that suggests, Brad is particularly well placed to offer some perspective on Greg's work. He has numerous monographs and edited volumes to his name, including Practices of Dialogue in the Catholic Church in 2006, and Prophetic Obedience, Ecclesiology for a Dialogical Church in 2016. He's currently the principal investigator on a major research project entitled Taking Responsibility, Jesuit Educational Institutions Confront the Causes and Legacy of Clergy Sex Abuse. That will issue in a further monograph for Brad, Confronting the Church in Controversy. We are so grateful to have you with us, Brad. Welcome. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Okay, good. Greg here in the, in the list, but I trust you're there. It's a great pleasure to be here um, for Greg Ro Ryan's uh, book launch of Hermeneutics of Doctrine in a Learning Church. The particular topic of hermeneutics has uh, generated many books over the last two generations. And even over the last two centuries, if we start the clock with German romanticism. My generation of students at the University of Chicago was schooled by Paul Ricoeur and David Tracy in the debates about author-centered approaches to hermeneutics in the tradition of Schleiermacher, the text-centered or content-centered approaches associated with Martin Heidegger, Hans-Georg Gadamer, and Paul Ricoeur, and the reception-oriented approaches advanced by Hans Robert Yaus. These orientations were increasingly problematized by critical theories developed by Freud and Lacan, the Frankfurt School of Adorno, Horkheimer, and Habermas, followed by Derrida and Foucault, and by feminist and liberation, uh, liberationist questions and approaches. This book by Greg Ryan helps us to address the situation now as the hermeneutical conundrums have multiplied and the strategies for addressing them have become more complex and contested. And in the midst of this debate, the transmission of doctrines has too often become disjointed, as Pope Francis puts it, fragmented, imposed, and lifeless. How is the transmission of doctrine disjointed for Ryan? And how can we transmit doctrine, tradition, and the faith of the church with integrity in this world? This is not about the previous generation of Catholic scholars addressing this issue, but rather it engages the next generation of scholars following Paul Murray on receptive ecumenism as he is influenced by the philosophy of Nicholas Rescher, Orman Rush on receptive hermeneutics, informed by his work on Hans Robert Yaus, and Francis Schusler Fiorenza, who seeks a reconstruction of tradition through a receptive hermeneutics that incorporates critical background theories, supported by a pragmatic coherentist theory, supporting his use of retroductive warrants drawn upon using a broad reflective equilibrium. It could be said that Ryan's book is about the, um, the challenges of reception by disheartened and too often disaffiliated church members and seekers at the margins of the church who search for what might be entailed to cultivate a receptive integrity and receptive learning in a terribly wounded and dysfunctional church and world. These three main authors that he's dealing with are English writing theologians who hail from England, Australia, and the United States. One might wonder if other theologians from European, Latin American, Asian, or African nations might offer different examples of disjoint disjointedness, disaffiliation, and diverse his hermeneutical solutions. 
However, I'm inclined to believe that Ryan can lean on instances of failed transmission and reception and application of doctrine that are addressed by Pope Francis that cut across these global land masses, divorce and remarriage, LGBTQ issues, the clergy sex abuse of minors and vulnerable populations, and the apocalyptic threat of the ecosystem. It might be interesting to see what other nationalities of theologians might contribute, but I think Ryan's theological options are coherent, compelling, and even convincing uh, in a polyglot or for a polyglot assembly. I want to turn my attention uh, to closing remarks on uh, two key issues that I really want to focus on, two key sources of disjointedness treated by Ryan. One is his attention to the role of wounds and dysfunction in the church using the example of clergy sex abuse. The second has to do with the role of conflict and consensus in the church. Ryan focuses on the importance of dynamic integrity in the work of Paul Murray. As Ryan explains, I have recommended the coherentist model of Fiorenza and Murray using the concept of integrity. Interpreted together the insights of Orm and Rush, Fiorenza and Murray give substance to an understanding of doctrinal interpretation as oriented toward both receptive integrity and receptive integrity. In other words, he offers an authentic receptivity to a living faith tradition and an honest form of engaging the tradition. Murray uses the category of dynamic integrity to give multiple coherence-based uh, considerations uh, concerning internal matters associated with scripture and tradition, primarily, external areas of coherence with contemporary ways of understanding the world, and pragmatic coherence by engaging others in the world through action. I find that Murray's three forms of coherence provide immensely helpful methodological resources for analyzing the causes and legacies of wounds, dysfunctions, incoherence, and pathologies in the church and in society, and explores forms of ecclesial learning that might help us find a way forward to, together in the church. Ryan clarifies how Murray's approach to receptive ecumenism provides a way to move beyond a disjointed transmission of the faith uh, and escalating disaffiliation. Murray's use of Rescher's coherentist theory provides reasons to reject an essentialist approach to the identity of Christianity, as well as the need to rely on the older form content distinction in support of a pluralizing approach. And this has compatibility with Rush's use of um, Yaus's and Bakhtin's advancement of a pluralizing approach to receptive history that recognizes the unacceptability of a fusion of horizons as the hermeneutical goal advanced by Hans Georg Gadamer in favor of Yaus's approach to a differentiation of horizons. However, I think Ryan paves a way for us to say more. The critique of a simplistic consensus theory of truth as espoused by pragmatist theories is sound and enables one to nuance theories of consensus without necessarily jettisoning them in order to be aided by a pluralizing and differentiating approach to consensus. Consensus is not equivalent to the truth, as Paul Murray and others have said, 
but it can provide a sick situated collective engagement with reality in a pluralized and polycentric historical and evolving world. The fact of the matter is that in the spirit of Pope Francis's Fratelli Tutti, we need to cultivate social friendships in the church and in civil society in order to move beyond ecclesial and political polarization. This does not mean the end of all consensus, nor the end of conflict and our need to, quote, to caress conflict, to use the expression of Pope Francis. We do not need to deny a role for dissensus in our dialogue, nor the need for an agonistic approach to synodality and democracy. We only need resources for a differentiated and differentiating consensus in the church, which Ryan helps, helps us to provide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brad, for those very insightful and um, well thought through reflections. I'm gonna turn straight immediately to introduce our second respondent and that some of this layer upon layer of conversation will unfold in breakout and question and answer. Thank you again. Dr. Antonia Pizzi is a lecturer and postdoctoral research fellow in the School of Theology at the Australian Catholic University. Her PhD focused on the relationship between receptive ecumenism and spiritual ecumenism. And that was subsequently published by Brill in 2019 as Receptive Ecumenism and the Renewal of the Ecumenical Movement, the Path of Ecclesial Conversion. Tony is shortly to start on a five-year joint research project with Ormond Rush and colleagues at KU Leuven on some key themes in Vatican II. And Tony's own specific focus will be on the concept of the Pilgrim Church and the intrinsic openness that that implies to ecclesial conversion, reform, and transformative learning, all of which is again, obviously highly relevant to our conversation today about Greg's book. Tony, we are so grateful to have you with us too, so early at the start of your day in, in Australia and our tomorrow. Thank you so much, Paul. It's wonderful to be here to help celebrate this book. In this book, Greg offers a rich and, oh, sorry, offers a rich and, caref and careful scholarly and yet deeply pastoral contribution to the conversation around how we can understand doctrine today in the complexity and plurality of our contexts. This is one of the most important questions for every Christian, a question every generation must face. As posed by St. Paul, how can we make an account of the hope that is within us? Or as Greg says, how can we receive with integrity? I have learned a lot from this book. It is not a quick book to be skimmed and then shelved. Instead, this is a deeply significant and relevant book. It is a lively and challenging conversation partner to be reached for and read over again. With careful, thoughtful scholarship, Greg has brought together the voices of a wide range of thinkers, most notably Fiorenza, Thistleton, Murray and Rush, reading them alongside Pope Francis. And in doing so, he has offered new insights and perspectives into their work. He skillfully weaves them together into a rich dialogue with each other and with key contemporary questions. This is the type of book which continues to offer new insights and will be relevant and helpful for years and readers to come. There's a lot of Greg in this book. It is calmly considered, deeply thoughtful, eminently scholarly, and expresses real pastoral concern. Throughout, Greg displays his conviction that doctrine is not an abstract concept, but instead a lived reality. As he says, 
the doctrinal emerges precisely in the pastoral. One of the things I appreciated most was Greg's concern to provide concrete examples to help the reader engage with what can be very abstract concepts. He tackles a wide range of examples from liturgical music to the Eucharist to some of the key questions and challenges for the Catholic Church today, such as discussions around the female diaconate and the child's sexual abuse crisis in the church. Greg's emphasis on lived reality, lived tradition, and lived experience was like a breath of fresh, cool air on an Australian summer's day, serving to freshen and enliven the deeply theological concepts under discussion. This is not to say, however, that he overemphasized lived experience or prioritized it above that of other key factors as Greg developed a balanced approach, but he convincingly argues that lived experience should be included as a further hermeneutical perspective and as one of the important factors to be considered. As someone who teaches undergraduate theology students, I can only applaud Greg's focus here. It is all too often that a doctrine can become abstracted and if abstracted, in danger of becoming unmoored. With ecclesiology as an example, too often students seek to approach the church only from an abstract point of view and end up with an unhealthy disconnect between the doctrine of the church and their own lived experience. Greg's work here in providing a balanced approach is very helpful. One musing I have is around the eschatological aspect of doctrine. Greg rightly places focus on lived reality and pastoral concerns, but I wonder whether, as well as focusing on lived experience, could we also work somewhat backwards from the eschatological vision of the kingdom of God to consider, diagnose, or constructively approach key challenges today? While Greg informs his reader that it might seem a little surprising to move from theological hermeneutics to discuss ecumenical method in the final chapter, his chapter on receptive ecumenism offers a fitting and rich culmination to his argument. Here he draws together the various threads woven throughout and presents receptive ecumenism as an example of the focus on dynamic integrity, which he has carefully traced through the work of Fiorenza, Thistleton, Rush and Murray. In its own right, the chapter offers a helpful contribution to the growing body of work on receptive ecumenism. Greg correctly points to a lack so far of focus on the underlying methodological commitments of receptive ecumenism, which as he rightly points out, can at times be dangerously oversimplified. Greg's application of Russia's reception hermeneutics to receptive ecumenism serves both to deepen receptive ecumenism and place it in a broader framework. In doing so, he offers a real contribution to the ongoing development of receptive ecumenism, successfully digging deeply into its underlying methodological principles and providing a very helpful integration with reception hermeneutics. His work here will be valuable to all those involved in receptive ecumenism. One point he makes I found particularly intriguing that it is a mistake to view receptive ecumenism exclusively in terms of it being an ecumenical strategy. Rather, receptive ecumenism should be approached as part of the broader commitment to ecclesial con conversion and renewal. Overall, he says, it is an exemplar of what receptive integrity looks like in practice. Therefore, undertaking receptive ecumenism is not done for the sake of doing receptive ecumenism, but rather out of concern for ecclesial learning and conversion. Greg's point here is timely and welcome, as too often ecumenism is understood as something to be tacked on to the end of an ecclesial to-do list, when really, as he illustrates here, ecumenical learning and reception is a core part of ecclesial learning. In this way, Greg has clearly conveyed how receptive ecumenism 
is of far more relevance than just to the ecumenical movement, important though that is. Greg offers us no shortcuts, no quick fix or glib seeming solutions to the vital question of how to approach doctrine and receive with integrity. Instead, he draws us into the range and complexity of factors that need to be taken into account while consistently applying them to concrete examples. This is a great achievement and a valuable contribution to the debate on what it might mean to actually be a learning church. Greg's question is, how can we receive with integrity? All I can say is that this book will be received with appreciation. Thank you, Greg. Oh, thank you so much, Tony, for those really helpful and perceptive thoughts and comments. Greg, I was wondering whether you could tell us, it's just a different angle on the book, what are you most proud of in the book, would you say? Is there one thing that you're particularly happy with in it? Gosh, um, thank you, Karen. I think the, um, the, the, the instinctive answer of any PhD student to that is getting it finished, of course. Um, yeah, there's a huge relief. One of the things I found was um, having written it, you know, which I wrote through the thesis and then revised it and sent it off for publication and came back to it. And I, I don't know what other people's experience has been of, of writing the writing process. Um, but I found I couldn't really bear to pick it up for a, for a few weeks after receiving it. You know, I'd kind of lived with it for so long and I was intimately knew it. So it, when, the, when the print copies arrived after a quick check through them, it then sat on the shelf for, for a few weeks. And when I, went, when I went back to it and read it through, I think the thing I was most pleased about was, was the overall narrative structure to it. The fact that these things that part of the reason I chose to work with these three theologians was that with the exception of Fiorenza and Rush, where, where Orm Rush draws on Fiorenza, they hadn't really been placed together. And, and there's other people, so John Thiel's work would be, would be another example, this kind of fantastic piece of work, but hadn't been integrated with other conversations that were going on uh, at the same time in an explicit way. So the fact that I brought them together and put them into what seems to be a narrative that works, I think, I think that, that holistic thing is possibly the, the thing that stands out for me. Thank you. Okay, well, we've got some um, a, a pair of questions here which actually go together really nicely and relate to something that had there been further more time earlier, I'd have uh, been interested to ask. Looking at recognizing that you've taken receptive ecumenism for your case study, what do you think is the relevance for other traditions to receive from these in? To what extent does the book mainly apply to the Catholic Church and to what extent the church in an ecumenical sense? So if you want to riff on that for a bit, Greg. Yeah, th thanks. But Great question. The um, I was aware of this all the way through. Actually, I was aware that there were Catholic theologians. I was writing this quite intentionally, using uh, resources from within the tradition that I'm I'm situated in, but then developing this this very strong ecumenical perspective later on. So I think um, I think to answer part of that question, there is nothing i don't think there's anything in there that is intrinsically um going to be intrinsically difficult for it, another tradition to pick up and apply although exactly how it's done um would differ from place to place i mean in, in a way this is some somewhat of a circular motion that a lot of the uh, the, the kind of um tools for doing this hermeneutics of doctrine in theology largely come from the development around biblical hermeneutics so in that biblical hermeneutics, as most of you will know, was something that was very strongly developed in the Protestant churches uh, and has been picked up later on in, in the Catholic Church. But then the application of that specifically to doctrine, you know, the major work on that is by an Anglican theologian, Tony Thistleton, who, who I engage with. Um, so again, we, we've kind of this very, in some ways, a very Catholic book. It's dealing with the teachings of popes and Catholic theologians. The initial impetus for it um, came really from reading Thistleton, you know, an Anglican dealing with this, and quite an evangelical Anglican dealing with the same issues precisely in doctrine, not just in scripture. 
Uh, and then reading Evangelii Gaudium shortly after that, I could start seeing the connections between them. So yeah, absolutely. I think these are these are issues for for a lot of traditions. Uh, Thistleton's book itself draws on stuff from Mennonite and um, Baptist and Anglican uh, and Methodist traditions as well. So I think it's quite broad. Thanks, Greg. Um, I want to. I'm, I'm getting a lot of business here for you. Um, let's go to one from Mary McHugh, who is asking, how would you reflect on the synodal process currently being explored by the German church and the Vatican response to it? And this is, um, this is a, a really interesting topic and uh, what, something that I, I want to look at more. I know other people are, are doing work on this. I know Brad has done some work on, uh, on the synodal process as well. It's interesting that we've got this sudden um, crop of synodal processes going on in Germany, in Australia, in Liverpool here as well. And Liverpool as the archdiocese is kind of leading the way or the rest of the, uh, the UK is watching. So there's something of a, a, a feel of experimentation going on, specifically with the um, the German <clears throat> the German situation. I, I don't know is the is the answer on exactly how is this being interpreted with the Vatican. It's a moving target, and uh, there are kind of conflicting stories coming out. I don't think the there's enough data there to to really comment on it. Um, <clears throat> it's possible that you know, Francis has. Um, Unleashed, unleashed the whirlwind here, and and uh, you know, people are running with it in a very enthusiastic way. Um, but if if the what's going on with the synods around the world is um, a kind of reflection of the microcosm of the the fourteen fifteen synods, Francis was happy for there to be a mess, both in the uh, in in the auditorium and in the reception afterwards. Uh, but he also said it, this is this is with Peter and and under Peter. So I think what we're seeing with the German synod is that same tension. I think the mess will be fine, the dialogue is fine, um, but it needs to be done in the spirit of discernment. This was a criticism we had at the Amazon synod that some of the topics under discussion were being dealt with in what Brad helpfully referred to that agonistic way, that you know, parliamentary debate facing off each other, and not in a spirit of discernment. So I think that might be the key category for, for looking at it. Okay, I want to attempt to blend um, a couple of questions, which whilst distinct, there's a certain resonance. Um, Mike Canaris, who is a professor at um, Loyola Chicago and a former postdoc here in the CCS, says that our group's question revolves around how this can all have implications, ripples, relevancy when planted in the soil of the global South majority world post-colonial church. Our conversation tonight has overwhelmingly white attendees and the book cites many white authors that have been mentioned, but what could this elicit in other contexts and communities? And I just want to um, bring a complimentary comment from John, a question from John O'Brien here, who is, uh, uh, currently with us. Our, our question concerns how the assumed normative discourse and that of the excluded and wounded can learn with integrity from each other. So th there's, a, there's a couple of real um, googlies for you to, to, to do some um, footwork with, Greg. Yeah, I, th th this is, um, I think this is, this is a, a real a really major challenge when we talk about dialogue or consensus or learning from the other. And even when we talk about, uh, as for in, for example, in receptive ecumenism, learning from the ecclesial other, just how other is that? Um, are we really envisaging some uh, people who look just like us and do more or less the same things as us, but in a slightly different uh, white English a tradition down the road in the Anglican Church or in the Methodist Church. And there's a couple of comments that have been raised um, around that. You know, what does it look like in a, in a post-colonial setting? What does it look like to hear voices of women? Um, there are a few in the book, but 
you know, reading it through again, if Karen had asked me, what are you least satisfied with? That might be the point I'd, I'd said that on reading, rereading it, I was dissatisfied with the number of women's voices in it. Um, though there are a couple. Um, what does it look like to, you know, to hear from people who you really disagree with as well? Yeah, that they, you can't, this can't just be a kind of principle of niceness of saying we'll listen to all possible views. There has to be um, you know, some discrimination going on in terms of <clears throat> evaluating those perspectives. So um, one of the questions, one of the, to, you know, it's a huge topic and we could go on all night with it, but one of the specific things I'm, I'm thinking about is the, the example I keep going to back to in the book of, of women deacons. Now, what that looks like from a certain liberal Western perspective, where it's very influenced by a particular set of background theories about the role of women, not just in the church, but, but also in society, is potentially going to look very different in different cultures and in different settings and even in different uh, ecclesiologies around the world. So what, you know, what would that look like? Does the church have to move at one speed on that? So on the one hand, could there be a parallel approach to the one we saw for permanent deacons, male permanent deacons, where individual dioceses made decisions. That seems to have broadly worked okay. Um, people, you know, Salford, for example, in the UK have recently decided to um, to revisit that, that decision not to have permanent deacons. Or would this lead us down some of the challenges that we've seen, for example, in uh, the Anglican communion over decisions on ordination of women and uh, ordination to the Episcopate of women that become potentially church dividing. So I think that's the the key, one of the key issues is not just hearing the voices, important though that is, and I don't feel qualified to talk on that without actually hearing those voices. But what then, you know, when this gets, the circle gets closed, we move from see and judge to act. What are the options for acting that respect those, those different contexts as well? Does the church just have to move at one speed? Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, sw switch, switching gear a wee bit now. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know the full name. I just have the the, the, the the code, as it were, that's written. But Rose asks, I wonder if you intend to widen the audience of this important work for people without a formal theological background. I think the ordinary lay person might have a lot to learn from the content of this book in helping them with their lived faith. So that I had two moment, and I want to also try and get a few more in as well before the wire comes down. Okay, I had two very interesting comments from from uh, two readers who both of whom are on this call, so I won't name them. But uh, one of them, when when he read the book, said, um, "Yeah, this is really interesting. Have you thought about writing it the other way around, starting with Pope Francis and working outwards from from Francis and focusing on Francis as a kind of lens to see it through?" And because that might be an easier way into it than starting with Thistleton's overview of hermeneutics. Um, and another uh, another colleague on the call uh, read it through and said, this is great. He said, um, you need to do two things with it. Make it half the length and take the word hermeneutics out the title. So, yeah, I, absolutely. A few people have asked me this as uh, in, on an individual basis. Could, could something be done with this which is accessible half the length? There is a model for doing this. Um, Paul Lakeland, who's also on the call, uh, did a superb book called The Liberation of the Laity and revisited some of those themes and expanded them and developed them in Catholicism at the Crossroads, which was a much more accessible book, I felt. Uh, between those two, I think he manages to engage a vast audience, uh, and I'd like to do something similar with this. So um, if there are any publishers listening, you've just heard <laughs> Absolutely, the, yeah. the overture, yeah. Listen, um, I want to... Um, turn a question into a comment and then move into um, what might be our, our final time, our final question given what time it is. Um, returning to Mary, uh, one of the great um, participants in the Centre for Catholic Studies here in the Northeast, Mary McHugh, comments simply that the, the wealth of wisdom there is in religious congregations and um, not least female women's religious congregations uh, in, in this realm that could be learned from and making an encouraging comment that um, surely that can be drawn into this kind of exercise. Um, both Mary and Paul Lakeland, who you just mentioned from Fairfield, uh, ask for further reflection on the roles of Mary and Joseph uh, in the background. Paul is saying they don't seem as anxious as they were in the gospel. How are they? 
um, the two people, how are they, the two lay people relating to the learned rabbinic discourse in the foreground? And uh, Mary comments that um, were it not for Mary in the background, women wouldn't be in the image. Yeah, th thanks. I, I'm very aware of that that uh, deficiency in the image, uh, and also that interesting sort of diptych of Mary and and Joseph behind. Uh, in an original kind of longer reflection on that picture, I'd commented that Mary and Joseph thought they have uh, an advantage over the uh, the scholars, in that at least they're looking in the right place or they're, lo they're looking for the right person so they, they're aware of the Christ they're looking for the Christ but they have a certain complacency about it they both assume that they know where he is so there's a similar kind of complacency of having the answers that we might find with the scholars think the answers are in the um, the, the commentaries and in the scriptures uh, Mary and Joseph think the answer is with someone else and I'm sure there's a, a sermon or two to be written on that in the church but Mary is the only woman in the picture. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, with the hermeneutical perspective in place, that is partly reminding us of the, the limited context out of which the story was written, out of which these texts emerge, out of which the tradition emerges. It can't, one of the arguments of the book is that it can't be separated from history. There's no pure essence that we can get at. So that's shocking fact that there's only one woman she's at the back and she's only been by virtue of of who she is actually is is kind of part of the point you know that wasn't the intention of selecting that image but it does hammer home the fact that the um these are not innocent you know the whole set of critical theory and in, in reading these texts and in reading doctrine is that it's not simply um you know, it, it, it's not immune to to the issues of society around the time so yeah, I think it raises questions as it should. You know, this should not be comforting, it should be challenging. Okay, well, the formal part of our proceedings are coming to a close. We now need to thank, heartfelt thanks to Brad, Tony and Teresa, who is pressing the levers and making all this happen for us in the background, Teresa Phillips. And to each and every one of you for showing up and helping us to celebrate this further significant work from the CCS and of course, a particular word of thanks to you, Greg.